or one-on-one -on -one with Sean Paul. Ladies and gentlemen of the Island Music Conference Attendance Corps, could you take your seats, please? People, 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 can you take your seats, please? And those persons that are downstairs, can you make your way upstairs for me, please? Absolutely delight. Ladies and gentlemen, can you take your seats? And those persons who are downstairs, can you make your way upstairs, please? Ladies and gentlemen, we welcome to the stage one of Dance Hall's standard bearers, flag bearers, global, keeping Dance Hall strong on a global scale. His mother named him Sean Paul Henriquez. We call him a couple of things, Shonda Paul. Dutty Rock Head, all sorts of things. Welcome to the stage, ladies and gentlemen, Sean Paul. Yeah, 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 yeah. Feel the chain now. Yeah, yeah. Thunder Paul, so me go so then. Well, I don't really care what people say. I don't really watch what them want to do. Still, I got to stick to my girls like glue. And I might not play number two. It is always a privilege every time we've sat down. And we've been sitting down a couple of years now. <laughs> as young sure. as we are. Yeah, is it? <laughs> well, well, people who are such an important personality as yourself, I always make time for. Judy, I, I, I miss Badly, we call, we call her Miss um, Bades, Judy Badless. <laughs> Bades. I'm a friend, man. Mm -hmm. Now, before we get started, I want to tell you a few things. I want to tell you that in 1996, he released his first solo song, Baby Girl. In 2000, he released the debut album aptly titled Stage One. But it was Sean Paul's sophomore studio album, Dirty Rock, which actually catapulted his career to new heights in 2002. His monumental 22-track project earned multi-platinum certification. I got one of those on my wall. And the Grammy Award for Best Reggae Album. And a nomination in the category for Best New Artist. The first time that a dance hall artist had garnered such a distinction. Songs such as, Just Give Me The Light, Like Glue, I'm Still In Love With You, which you know we love that video, and Get Busy made it to the top 15 on the Billboard Hot 100 chart with Get Busy being Sean Paul's first solo number one hit. And through his 2006 album, The Trinity, Sean Paul was able to secure another solo number one hit with Temperature, the 11th track on the set. The song remains, as you know, a scorching party starter driven by hammering percussion, proving that Dutty Rock was not an outlier. The Trinity also went platinum, cementing his status as a hit maker for which he is still recognized to date. Put your hands together for the artist, Sean Paul. Respect. Respect. Yeah. Now, Dutty Rock crew, a quick conversation as to how Dutty Rock came about. Well, I started to try to produce in 2001. So on my first album, I produced one track on that album. Um, next step from there was quite a few years later. Uh, well, I, I think the third album, The Trinity, I put another track on there. And then around 2015, I started to kind of, uh, sorry, 2010, I put out a juggling featuring people like Beelman, Bounty Killer, myself, um, whole lot big artists on it. And I had a lot to learn as a product, as a producer, 
I, I see myself more as a beat maker. But the reason why I wanted to do it was to kind of partake more in the history of what was happening and not just to take, um, but to also give back in terms of trying to mentor artists and put out rhythms that I felt were m might have been missing in the culture or whatever. So 2015, we put out some more stuff. And then by 2017, we started to mentor artists like Chi Ching Ching. We put out an album for him. Um, you know, we've been working with younger artists such as Kwanda Jai, um, people like Rasa Jai, Soto Bless. And, and Kwanda Jai is actually that young Bob Marley yeah. in the movie. Yeah. So, um, you know, he, he, from the first time I asked him, what is your music like? He said to me, people say me sound like a young Bob Marley. <laughs> and, and to see him come get that role has been an amazing thing. Um, he's actually my cousin, um, my father's cousin's son. So, but we didn't grow up together. I'm way older than him, as you, as you might can tell. But yeah, I was just very proud of his steps and that kind of thing. And we just kind of trying to put together rhythms that we think need to be out there. You know, there's a few of us have to big up news. And I'm going to do this to, uh, to you again, news. News is Michigan's son from Michigan and Smiley. Yeah. So a lot of people, when they, they ask, who is this Brooklyn guy that, that Sean parring with? Um, to me, he knows just as much, as much about the business as any one of us that has grown here. Um, he's been involved in music forever, amongst Taras Riley and myself. And um, you know, he's the person that runs the label. So Dutty Rock label is really me, my brother, News, and Kappa Sean. Uh, with Sean Anderson, who is my, also my DJ. Well, all of us produce together. We have a big up Suko as well, because he's involved in the productions. Sometimes it will be a Suko rhythm that comes out. Sometimes it will be news rhythm. Sometimes it will be my rhythm. Um, but we all just get together, about four or five of us, and just try to see what, what we need to, you know, um, kind of put out to partake in the history. You, you lost know. a member of... of Dutty Rock. Dutty Cup. Dutty, sorry, Dutty Cup. But, well, mm -hmm. two now. So I have a big up Mr. Chicken. Yeah. And also Dadigan. Dadigan passed first. Um, you know, these guys were the first to embrace me from my inner city area. Um, you know, I'm from uptown, and it's, it's not usually seen or known that a kid like me came and wanted to do music or... And to do even, dance hall. Yeah, he, uh, even excelled at it, you know, so... Um, these were the first guys who would call me DJ and say, yeah, bro, you can do it. What do you mean? Finish the song there where you are, you know, where, 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 you, where I'm here, you're DJ. You know, finish it yet. I'm like, no, I don't think people like it. No, do it. You know, so there were some kids who kind of helped me out in the, in the whole first instance. So do you find that their that still exists? Sad. Sorry, sorry. You're no, their it. passing was just very sad for me um, over the years. And, um, you know, RIP to them. Do you find that that camaraderie still exists in the dance hall? And the question is specific. In the dance hall previously among DJs, you all would end up in the studio together. You mentioned something helping to finish a lyric or even you're singing a line of a song. We've experienced even during the, 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 the Beanie Bounty so-called war that one would help another finish the, the, the end of a sentence or, you know. Does that exist in this current dance hall? I think in certain camps, but there's less and less camps and more and more people wanting to be, you know, the standout guy. And, um, you know, we will always have man at the moment, but we, will, we need more monument man, man like Shaggy, mm -hmm. man like myself, who, you know, stand up and do it by yourself and also help other people along the way. And, yeah, we take advice from from just the littlest of person. I mean, there's sometimes my stage tech, not a little person, but um, big up Briga. You know, sometimes him have an insight in, in rehearsal that none of me or the band not looking to, to, to see. But because I know that he has been there over the years, I take him advice as well. You know I mean? He's been on every stage show that Jamaica has ever had, <laughs> so to speak. He tours on the road with me now. So when we in rehearsal and him have something to say, 
I'm going to listen. You know? And I think that is the sign of a monument person, somebody who is not afraid to, mm. to take um, the advice and then make the final decision and push forward for a better future for all persons involved. Yeah. So that means because you started out with Dotty Cup, you started out collaborating. So it, when people say that collaborations have led to your success, it has been actually from the start. You've always yeah. had that approach. Yeah, for sure. I mean, even just, just bringing a band together, you have to collab. The bass have to work with what the drummer do. And so for me, it's never been, oh, that, you know, there's any one person. Um, the great Bob Marley, you know, he had his band together, Carly Barrett and Aston Barrett, who was the, the, the background of the, of the beat. And so, you know, same thing when, when you watch the movie, the, mm -hmm. the same Bob movie, you will see when Cox and Dads them was like, no, them, them don't like what they was doing, just the guitar, them, them not, them lacking a drum and bass. And when that came together, it was all a collab to, to make his music more special, you know, or their music at the time more special. So for me, collaboration is important. It teaches each player in the game. Um, you know, uh, and you've done dozens. I mean, yeah, just bullet. looking at <laughs> Baby Boy with Beyonce, Rockabye with Clean Bandit, Cheap Thrills. I have to, they, they actually came in for Isla Music Conference yeah. yesterday. I don't see them here now, but they were oh here yeah. <laughs> yesterday. How do you choose who the persons are? That you collaborate. It's about the music to me now. It's always been about the feeling, you know. If it don't feel right in my gut, then I might be apprehensive. Um, even if I finish the song, I might be apprehensive to promote it or on stage. So it has to feel good from the gut, from the get-go. Um, and when I went to work with, say, Clean Bandits, I actually heard a song that they produced for themselves that I liked. And I asked my manager, who produced that? And she told me, and I said, why well, I work with them? And I went to work with them and did two tracks. And then them, them was like, tell me something. You would drop a verse on this and then play it for me. And I was like, yeah. I mean, the way I spit on that track, they, they must have cut out some. They were <laughs> I was ready. Because um, it just felt good. You know, I had grown up with a single mom. And that's what that song was about. It was easy to flow that for me. You know, so um, for me, it's just about, it, it, you know, it could be somebody who not many people know. Or it could, like, like an Alexis Jordan, I did a song with her in a year, 2010, when I was huge, you know, and she was relatively not known. Or it could be, you know, as you say, doing a song with a Beyonce or a Sia. It's about the song itself for me, you know. If it sounds good, feel good, I'm with it. There's been a couple of people from big groups and whatever that doing the Moon Solar Project, and I'm coming, I just never feel the project, never liked it. Um, and I, I just ended up not doing it. Um, one example is me and Ashanti, love her, love her music. Me and her are still good friends, speak well. But when we got together in studio, maybe it was the producer itself, the, the, the rhythms they were giving us, just never, it never connect. And we didn't end up doing the song. So for me, as I said, just about the feeling. And, and that, that also leads me to the collapse, you know. What kind of music did you grow up listening to? Um, the latest reggae. Uh, my father would play anything that was popular. But also my aunt was um, Sparkle's Disco, still is. And that's a, if anybody knows what Sparkle's Disco is, it's a big soca um, sound system. We got Bobby Wang. And these guys used to come and play in my yard because my grandmother's house where I live, whichever. She had a big front yard, and they used to hold Easter parties, and, you know, I used to be the box man, so me and my brother used to pick up the box them and sort out where the bar would be. I, I took pride in kind of setting up the place them time there. I was 12, 13 year old. Um, my mother is an avid fan of the Beatles and people like uh, Cat Stevens, and those are very great balladeers to me and songwriters, and, you know, it's, the Beatles is such a prolific band, so... Um, it was a wide, br br what do you call it, cross section of music. Um, you know, growing up in Jamaica, when you're playing football on, on the on the sidewalk or you know on the grass with friends, 
somebody will shout out, people, are you ready? Everybody say, bow, because it's the latest pastime. We didn't have a lot of Ferris wheels and a lot of playground um, type things to go to in the 70s growing up, but we had music. And I think that was our greatest pastime. When you hear America say their greatest pastime is like baseball, for me, is music for, for, for us. And, um, you know, we produce thousands of tracks. And so our repertoire, as just a listener when you're growing up, is very broad and wide. You know, it is always funny to people when they come to a Jamaican dance and you will hear like 2 33 in the morning. Um, the selector just kind of tired of the juggling that's going on now and just make a one very potent talk and drop a Celine Dion. And everybody says a whoop, 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 whoop. Because we are very diversified listeners, I would say, if that's a term. We, we have, you know, Kenny Rogers, big. Um, the ear supply type song. We, we know it all. And um, yes, it has to do with the radio people who used to play the songs back in the day and, and also the street DJs. But our listenership is, is large. And so for me, I can't tell you, I, I grew up listening to one thing, but I can tell you that at about 11, 12 years old, when dance hall started to become the forefront of what our music is, um, you know, we're coming from Mentaya to Ska to Rocksteady to Reggae, Dub, Dancehall. And when, when we did that, I, I thought, they, these people are speaking in the language what me and my friend them talk every day. And it was so um, magnetic to me and, and, and what, what I call grounding mm -hmm. that that, um, that was one of the biggest musics to me um, and still is today, you know. Very powerful. The rapping, I have to, I will have to go to, to Q&A. But there is a, a time in every huge artist career that he or she recognizes that him is a big artist. When was that recognition for you? Several times. <laughs> <laughs> because there's different stages, right? So... The first time I got to the dub plate for like Stone Love. The first time I crawled over the fence. There was a 20, so probably 22nd anniversary out at La Rousse. Um, and I go out there and I know they were playing my dubs. And I heard um, them start to talk. They said the stage show will soon start. The line was still very long. So me and my friend them gang up and jump over the fence. And security guard hold me, I want to beat me. And people's like, yo, love him, I'm the artist. And we went straight through and I went on stage and I was able to perform. For, so for me, I mean, listening to Stone Love cassettes growing up, um, that was like a stage, like a reach. You know what I mean? And then later on, there's different stages, like, you know, getting the recognition of, of, of uh, all the radio personalities in Jamaica and people wanting dubs and then, getting stage shows abroad and starting to tour and and then finally eventually putting out an album and you know getting um being being the, the biggest seller that year and then you know little after that another album and grammy so those were all steps that to me i couldn't believe were happening you know um i remember the first time my song played on the radio i uh, was I, I i had driven i had a demo and I had driven to Muta Baruka's bookshop because I knew he was going to be there. And he didn't reach yet, so I, I lay with him. I was going to UTEC at the time, which was Cass. And I um, sit down in, in the van, mother van, or a VW van. People used to call it the bread van. The wheel, big like this. <laughs> and um, I used to carry the whole Dutty Cup crew around and go to studios. But today I was alone. I went there. And Muta, Simeon, went up to him as him opening the door. I gave him the, 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 the record and said, you know, I'm a new artist. I just want to know what you think about it. And I'd listen to his show every, every Thursday night. And, you know, I was doing homework because I was still in school. So I had a school base. I said, like, a project to hand in. And I hear, I, I, really, I remember that him playing on the radio. As I push power up on the radio, Judy, I hear Muta say, this guy now, he have a song where he have something to say, just listen. And it was more conscious music at the time. 
I never had a cell phone them time there. Everybody in my house asleep. I could pick up the phone. Me, one. And I was jumping up and down in the living room. So that was the next stage for me, you know. I think that we must, we must not, um, we must, mustn't think that we reach at each of these stages. There's always more to accomplish, always more to learn. And so I, I think I set a high bar for myself in that respect. Um, so each stage I was thankful for, but also hungry for more. You know, great segue for the question, for the, for the story I would like to tell, just a quick story of being, there, there's a place on, on Constant Spring Road where we would have parties that DJ Sunshine used to play. Yeah. Rot Iron, the Mick Rot Iron are the same. And we're there waiting to go into this party that time I was at fame. Mm -hmm. And we're there waiting to go into this party now. And Sean Paul is in the line. Okay. And so them load him up and say, Sean Paul, come up, man. And he said, no, me not the line. We get just wait like everybody else. See it. <laughs> and I thought that that was so, so special. Yeah, well, even now when I come in at the airport, I still do that. Because a lot of people say, yo, you know, go up in the front. I say, no, because, you know, um, I feel like everybody deserves them chance, no matter who you be. And so, if you join the line before me, that's your chance for go before me. You know what I'm saying? I'm just wait my turn. Okay. Yeah. So, we go into a quick Q&A. We'll take three questions. Hello? Okay. Hey. Hi, good afternoon. Greetings. Um, I wanted to ask the question around seeing community as a instrument in individual success. And so, like, what's the length and breadth of your team? And how do they help you in focusing on the creative process while keeping your affairs in order? Boy, that's a deep question. Um, every artist needs a team to help them out um, with different things. And my team has basically remained the same over the years. Yes, managers have changed, but um, the same principle is there where they try to give me as much space as possible um, to do what I have to do, which is create and you know give good performances. Um, I have to big up Steve Wilson and my brother Jig Zagula. They're on a the management team. Jules is management as well. Jules Dougal. Um, those three people kind of handle a lot for me, as well as Jerome Hamilton, who is sitting right here today. Um, Jerome is my booking agent, but has gone far beyond being a booking agent for me. And it's good for artists to find someone like that, where they're a booking agent, but also plays part in... He's a booking agent, but also plays part in, in the day-to-day -day management of, you know, um, my time. And, and has become such a good friend that um, it, it, it is his advice that I seek a, a lot when it comes down to different things as well. So it's very important. So I mentioned four people so far. News is the next one I mentioned that he is um, part of the, the production side of the team. And I, I've mentioned those production people before. Um, when it comes to being the artist, uh, I don't like when people tell me what to do. I like the suggestions though. Um, uh, and then when it comes to be the producer, I am more of oriented into that, that suggestion um, scenario where you know, I will beat a drum beat or a bass line and, and ask advice mainly. As the artist now, I want to create by myself, but I do take the, the opinions and suggestions. And um, I think that all of those players that I mentioned help to keep my focus. Um, I have a band leader named Nigel Staff, who is also um, someone who I bounce many ideas off of in terms of just the music industry alone. And it helps, those conversations help. Um, for you to make decisions, for you to come up with your own um, idea of, of what should be next for you as an artist. Right there, so I have an artist who worked with me forever, Fahrenheit. He's been um, somebody who 
you know, has been just a supporting act for me, but also somebody who I produce as an artist now. And we have many conversations on tour about songs we like, about artists we like, or, or, or things in the business that we disagree on or, or, or don't like to see. And that, again, helps me to formulate who I am as an artist. So the community is big. It's not, it's not just, you know, a, a neat little circle and I control everything. I take advice from a lot of people. Um, Mr. Burrell is sitting here. We have many conversations. Uh, big up Shaggy. From the beginning, from I started to become more of a popular entertainer, he always had great advice for me. And um, as, a, as a mentor, as somebody who has gone through a very similar path where, you know, um, we, we were somebody who not really looked upon as the, 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 the usual person to succeed in this music. But then we break and break internationally also. And it comes with a lot of, of steps and a lot of heartache, a lot of pain, which the public might not see. And he has walked me through a lot of the stages. So big up to Shaggy as well. And as I say, you know, many producers, I can mention so many, Steely, God rest his soul. Um, he was the first person to tell me, he said, yo, the, the, the crowd going to give you a, 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 a ladder for climb. And they might cheer you, but they never tell you, say, in the middle of the ladder, they grease it. And when you, when you slip on a slide now, they might laugh after you. Same one, they might cheer you. Your skin have a tick. And, and honestly, that was one of the, the, in the early years. And I think him, you look for me, and him just knows that the boy had too, his personality is too soft. Him needs some budding up. And he used to bad me up a lot, especially when voicing. And that, that gave me um, such a, 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 a determination to prove myself to him because uh, he was a producer who I respected so much. Um, and then, you know, it, it made me strong. Like when you go through the fire, you become the diamond, you know? Yeah. Second question. Two, two, two. Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. Respect. My name is Mono. I'm from Zimbabwe. Ah. Uh, somebody called me Mr. Zimbabwe yesterday. Zim. <laughs> Zimbabwe. Yes. Yeah, man. Zim, yeah. Zim, Zim. You've been to our country. Once I've been, yeah. I've been to Zimbabwe. Very awesome experience. Yeah, yeah. Well, and our people love you there. Respect. So my question is, um, I'm speaking of behalf of my Zimbabwean musicians. And uh, when you reply, you're not replying to me alone. You are speaking to them. Yeah. So what I, what I would like to say is, um, ever since I started coming to this uh, conference, I was very surprised and impressed by seeing so many popular musicians coming to sit in the crowd and listen to to, to, to other speakers. Mm -hmm. I've seen Shaggy, I've seen Tabaruka, I've seen Nadine Sutherland, I saw Spice. So I was very impressed. So what I'm trying to get at is um, in Zimbabwe, once anybody gets some kind of popularity, you never see them at a conference like this. <laughs> <laughs> Zin. They don't come. Zin. Yeah, and um, sometimes we have problems when artists start fighting each other over copyright issues and some very minor small things that could have been tackled at conferences like this. So now what I want, what I'm requesting you to do is to speak to my, to my fellow artists in Zimbabwe. They respect you very much. Yeah. So as you reply, you are not replying to me. Sure. You are replying to them. So right. what can you tell them about attending conferences, about attending workshops, and the importance of gaining knowledge as a musician? Thank you. Okay. To answer your question, to Zimbabwe and anybody else who wants to, to, to understand, um, knowledge is power. That is, that's the key right there. And so when you have um, a conference like this and you have big players in the game coming to spill their guts and tell you the truth, um, that is, there's nothing like that knowledge. There's nothing that can compare to that knowledge. Um, you know, we are living in an information age where, you know, these co big companies want every um, 
information that they can get on you. Um, so as an artist or a musician, to come to a conference like this is probably the best way that you can get different stories um, all in one. You know, as Judith was asking me earlier about the camar camaraderie in dancehall music, I used to go to studios and be a fly on the wall. I would walk, stand up in Slide Down Bar Studio and just put my back right there up on the wall and watch General B. Vice, watch um, people like, you know, Bunty Killer come in the studio and just rap and reason and, and give joke. And also, you know, be the man, Vice. And that gave me a lot of information. It wasn't something that somebody could tell me. It was something that I had to experience myself. So when it comes on to these conferences, the best thing to come and experience it. There's a lot of people here with a lot of knowledge, people who have been key players in the game. And, um, you know, wh while it is hard to get people who are on a busy schedule to come, you must always try to make time. Because when you say, as an artist, you have to keep your ears to the ground, which means you have to know what's going on in the business. This is one of the best types of environment to, to, to get that knowledge and that info. So, yeah. Thanks. Final question. Salute. Who has the final question? One of the things that we'll be doing here, Sean, is premiering Bad Like Brooklyn Dance Hall. Mm. And you're the, in the a part of that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Why is that? What was making that so significantly important? For me, there was some huge um, places on earth that supported our music to the core. Like if a song came out today in Jamaica and it's popular, those places would carry it the next day, if not very soon after that. And New York was definitely a spot like that. And that time they were moving vinyl. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so... so um, when you, when you have such a stronghold of a place like New York, most of the East Coast was, was um, a, a, what can I say, area as well, like you know Miami, um, places like DC. Those were the places I was getting my first shows. And ev Atlanta, a lot of the East Coast, you know, New Jersey, New, um, Connecticut, these type of spots. But the tri-state area in, in general, and it, it stemmed from Brooklyn, it stemmed from the artists were there, the producers were there, the studios that were there, the culture was there, you know? Mm -hmm. So when Shaggy stepped to me and said, we're doing this, I had, I had no problem for talk, my talk about just um, how it was during those times. Because as, I, as you just rightly said, it was vinyl, it wasn't no social media age. And as I said, if a I, if I song hit today, mm -hmm. tomorrow, you're going to hear it in Brooklyn, you're going to hear people that talk about it. And that's why it was such a very important part of the story. We have to say big up to artists like you who were able to take us so far overseas with no social media, you know? No easy feat, no easy feat at all. Bad Like Brooklyn Dance Hall premieres, IMC premieres it on Sunday evening. So make sure that you're here for that. Who has the final question? Righty. But tomorrow evening, actually. Blessings. Yes, madam. Uh, my question, uh, this is Lex. I'm a part of the versions group. Uh, my question to you is, how have you managed to hold on to you, the personality, and build on your brand, the brand that is Sean Paul, and still be able to divide those two lives, keep them separate? It's been a, it's been a, it's been a thing, man. It's been a balancing act, for sure. Um, but everything in life to me is about balance and um, you know when, when this started to happen to me it, it, I say happen to me because so much things when you have just one song out there that is popular come into your life so much things start you start attracting so much different things um, and it's been hard to, to, to kind of balance it out for sure when I talk about the conversations with me and Shaggy those are the things we speak about as well. Balancing family life, balancing, um, you know, being a hype artist out there that is popular, uh, it's a lot. Um, but for me, 
my family, especially my mom, my brother, my wife, they keep me grounded. And though Ram for tell me the real truth uh, of how I, I might be seeming to them. And I've been around other artists where, it, you know, to be an artist, it is honestly, and especially in this day and age, it is a very narcissistic thing because you're thinking about yourself 24-7, almost. You know, you're thinking about you, you, the song you're writing, you're thinking about the public, the, how to, to, to um, put out that song, you're thinking about how to make it popular, you're thinking about which dance to go on. It's all about you. And there's times where I have to remind myself or rem be reminded by family. I say, hey boy, what you do? <laughs> I'm going to take the bad up them. You know what I'm saying? Uh, for me, it is, it is um, important to not lose yourself. It's been a hard balancing act, as I said. But, you know, I, I think what has helped me also, bro, is just time was on my side in terms of I didn't become popular in this country until I was 24 years old. That's relatively, in dancehall perspective, down the years, you know what I'm saying? Uh, being a man was popular when he was nine years old. Um, you know, a lot of other artists start when they're teenagers and still in school. She, you know, is one of them. Um, there's so many that I can mention, and they're very popular artists and prolific artists too. Um, so I think what kind of helped me out is that I was 24, I already knew who I was. And no matter what came at me, uh, that my, what influences came at me that might have changed me, I always kind of grown back myself with the help of family and, and just kind of that background still. So, yeah. Penultimate question, as such a, a global artist, representing Jamaica. Do you have two different sets that you perform? So when you perform couple. overseas, is it this Sean Paul? But when you come back to Jamaica, is that a different one? It's a couple of different ones. Um, because like, just for instance, even in Jamaica alone, uh, this Christmas I worked on, uh, just was called up on the stage with Popcorn at Unruly Fest. And that was a 15-minute segment, which I knew I had to be potent in. So I didn't want to over-speak, or I didn't want to, um, you know, just, just take up too much time and not do the, the, the proper hits that I had. But then I also, in January, did Rebel Salute. And that was a show I had a little more time on, and I was able to, to make statement and, and speak to the people more. So, so on every stage show, you have to kind of know where you what what you're doing uh, uh, and and how to present yourself definitely if i'm in you know like a, a spot like new jersey and i know there's a lot of latino in there i'm gonna sing baby girl see you take care of party. you know i'm gonna do that spanish that i've been learning um so so you know th there's always, and sometimes i do misjudge like i will go out there and say oh this crowd is just a pop crowd and when i actually reach out there I realized, say, yo, them people that want some deep songs, they want more like, you know, the, the yardcore thing them, that them used to them, love, deport them. Um, but there's years where, you know, you know, a song is hitting in Europe alone, and, and you, you can do that song uh, with a big reaction, and you put it into the set. So um, every, every stage show for me is, is a thing to ponder, which is why I talk to my band leader, um, I'm a brother a lot about, you know, what we're going to present to the people. And yeah, I think every artist should do that. I don't think it should just be a generic thing where, you know, you're just going to do this show because it works. Um, there's sometimes that you have to do a difference, especially when you have so much song like myself. Okay. Tell us about your new music as we wrap and what's going about on for 2024. New music? Yeah. Um, well, big up Barry Salmon. Uh, somebody who is, uh, you know, a, a huge influence on, on music in our culture alone and should be revered as much more than he is, I believe. Um, I did a song with him last year. It was called Rebel Time, and that was an awesome vibe. Production by myself and news. And um, we come again this year with another song called Tender Tender, which actually is on a juggling rhythm. So both of them are one-drops. 
um, this being reggae month, I thought it to be um, very, uh, you know, uh, reggae to me and dancehall to me lives year round, but I thought it was very, uh, what's the word, uh, fitting then to release these songs during this time. So, and the juggling of people like Rasa Jai, Kwanda Jai was in the movie. The both of them were in the movie. Um, Ras was playing um, Claude Massop, and and Kwanda Jai playing, you know, the great gang himself. Um, Mark Asai is on the rhythm. Myself is on the rhythm. Busy Signal on the rhythm. Sorry, me and Barry Simon on the rhythm. Um, Aisha Whaler's on the rhythm. So that's the latest project that Dirty Rock put out. Uh, Fire and Easy is on the rhythm. Um, and I also have another one drop that I released earlier in the month. It's called No Evil, when I'm singing in falsetta. So a lot of people didn't know it was me and wondering what I did to do that. I have to put my, my toe in a, in a glass of ice water if it sinks so high, you know? <laughs> but, but um, yeah, th those are the latest productions. I'm also on, you know, um, Russian uh, Dirty Money Rhythm, which has been kind of pushing forward for me in the States on the radio right now is the song that I've been watching. Um, you know, I have so much different collabs to come out. I've worked with Becky G again. That should come out later on this year. I've worked with Jada Kingdom, even though people were seeing me um, dis disgruntled at the, the Clash vibe, which I can just say to you, me as a Jamaican growing up here, seeing Clash, I know it's important to us. But I haven't seen, um, I, I can't say I haven't seen. I, I can say that I have seen more songs that, are, that reach out to, to, to a wider section of people become very, very big hits for the artists and for everybody around them without clashing. And that's why I kind of was speaking on that. But yeah, big up to Jada. Uh, I just done tour with Steph London too. Um, but, but look out for those kind of songs. That, that <laughs> everybody laughing at. <laughs> but yeah, I just, um, I just, just, uh, yeah, the thing of a balance, man. <laughs> so, um, I just putting out those songs later this year, as I said. So, yeah. Thank you very much, Sean Paul Thank Henriquez. You Appreciate. Oh. <laughs>